Well, we're going to continue on with our series about life's questions, and today we're going to talk about the question, why do I feel so all alone? And I'm sure we've all had those feelings, maybe feeling it right now. Well, a Russian company thought they could help their customers who felt alone, and they came up with a kind of interesting product, and it's a cap for a bottle of vodka, because we know Russians drink a lot of vodka, right? And this cap actually toasts and giggles when it's unscrewed. <laughs> so the thing costs $5, and for $5 you actually get a drinking companion with a repertoire of 14 different phrases that this cap says, including Let's Pour, the famous Russian drinking song. And then the more times they say that you unscrew the cap and, and take a drink, the speech on the cap starts getting slurred, just like if you were drunk. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> well, it might not be too helpful about being lonely, but it certainly is creative. <clears throat> but the fact is that many people in our culture feel very alone, and a lot of them turn to drinking. It's one way some of them try to find some level of comfort in the bottle. And they say when they do surveys of people that, of all the people they survey, at least 26% of the people when asked, are you lonely, responded yes. Uh, a fellow by the name of Steve Covey uh, <clears throat> did a book called Seven Habits of <clears throat> Highly Effective Families. And he found that the divorce rate in the United States has more than doubled. Uh, single parent homes has tripled. Teen suicide is up over 30%. And the number one health problem uh, for American women is actually domestic violence. So it's no wonder that there's so much loneliness in our world. You know, we fill our schedules with wall-to-wall -wall things to do, right? We, we pack in meeting after meeting if we're, we're employed. Uh, phone call after phone call, no matter what we're doing. Almost everybody now has a cell phone. They can't give up their cell phone for anything. People go out to eat and you see, Instead of husband and wife and couples and families talking to each other, they're all doing something on the cell phone and nobody's speaking. Nobody is speaking. Even kids have cell phones. But despite all the activity and people, we really connect with other people. We've become such an age of non-communication other than through electronic means. But people have been feeling lonely for a long time. King David felt lonely when he cried out to God. And if we look at Psalm 25, verse 16, he says, Turn to me and have mercy, for I am alone and I'm in deep distress. Have we ever felt that way? I think most of us have it at some time, and it's, a, it's distressing to feel that way. So today we're going to try to find out some solutions to loneliness. But in order to do that, we've got to find out what are the reasons for loneliness. Loneliness is the problem, so let's find out what causes it, and then we can figure out how to fix it. And I don't think there's any single reason for loneliness, but the ones we have today are probably just going to scratch the surface, but sometimes it's helpful to understand some reasons behind a problem if we're going to come up with a solution. Reason number one for loneliness. No meaningful relationships. You know, some people are lonely because they have no relationships in their life. But you see, most people really do have relationships. They just don't realize it. The problem is the relationships they have are lacking any type of depth or closeness. You might know somebody, right? But you don't share things that are on your mind with each other. Psalm 142 and 4 says, I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. And I think a lot of people feel exactly like that. And when David actually wrote this, he was being hunted like a wild animal by King Saul. He was experiencing one of the most difficult experiences in his life, and he felt like there was no one who, who cared about what was going on with him, Nobody took notice of his dilemma. He thought, wow, I'm going through all this and, and nobody even cares. And I'm sure we've all felt like that at one time or another. 
You might have plenty of folks around you, but none that you feel you can really share with. For whatever reason, the relationship never goes below the surface. Sometimes you're afraid to share anything, feeling that people are going to condemn you or talk about you for it. And then what happens is you keep it all in. You never want to share anything. You never get close to anybody. You feel hurt, hurt. You feel lonely. You think you're in this by yourself. When the problem is really you because you don't want to share anything with anybody who maybe could help you through this. Number two is what we just spoke about, a fear of rejection. Some people are so afraid of being rejected by others that they make no attempt to even build a relationship. Something always comes up, they can't deal with it. Now I'm not talking about being shy, but about actually staying away from people and situations where a friendship might be built, but then they don't do it because they fear they're going to be Far apart. So loneliness is one problem that we just spoke of is because we don't have any meaningful relationships. And the second is we're afraid of rejection. The more we find ourselves demonstrating this type of behavior of, of not wanting to share anything with anybody, then we think we're not worthy of a relationship with others and we keep all that stuff inside and then we feel like we're going through this all by ourselves. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to help. Another reason for loneliness is abusive, abusive situations. Now, when you suffer from abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual, you have a problem trusting some people. Anybody. You know, it doesn't have to be somebody who abused you. You can't trust nobody. You're afraid to build any kind of meaningful relationship but for fear that it might turn into something bad. And you go through life lonely, and most of the time you're afraid. The other reason for loneliness is maybe in the past you had a broken heart. What does Proverbs say to that? Proverbs 15, verse 13 says, A glad heart makes a happy face, and a broken heart crushes the spirit. And I think that's really true, isn't it? Your heart may be broken by a failed marriage, by a, a death of a person that's close to you, a friendship that has ended. Anything could break your heart. You want nothing more than to have your heart healed, to get healthy again, to build living relationship, but your spirit, as the Bible said, is crushed because of that broken heart. And you don't know where to turn. You know, sometimes we rely on things to make our hearts smile, but the wrong things. We rely on other people, and then when they don't do what we think they should do, we feel broken heart. When all the time, if our love was centered on God, amen, who would never break your heart, it's okay to have relationships with other people, but don't rely on them for the only thing to keep your heart going, right? All right, so we talked about some of these reasons what do we do to fix it? All right, well, let's look at the steps to restoration for loneliness. And I believe that this feeling of loneliness as being without anyone to relate to is one of the strongest spiritual weapons that the enemy uses against us. That's how he breaks our spirit. God doesn't want us to have a broken spirit, does he? And it's when we're at the breaking point that what happens? Who takes over control of the wheel? The devil. When we have a broken spirit, the devil says, all right, man, they opened the door, here I come. But there is hope, and this, this can be overcome, but it takes a little work. And what I want to give today are four steps that directly answer the reasons for loneliness we spoke about. And if our problem is, number one, that we don't have a meaningful relationship, what's the first thing we should do? Realize that we do have a relationship and accept our position in God's family. If we're a Christian, there are meaningful relationships all around us, just waiting for us to take advantage of. If we're not a Christian, when you become one, we'll soon discover, wow, I do have a family. 
there's a sense that simply knowing the fact that I'm a member of God's family, that, hey man, I'm never going to be alone. I got not only God, but all these other Christians as my family. Once people came to Jesus and told him, oh, Jesus, your family came here to see you, because he was speaking and so forth. And in Mark 3 and 33, Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked around him and looked at all the people there and he said, Look, these are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who what does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. He said, you tell me my mom came to see me, but this is all my family. This is all my family. If we're living in a relationship with Christ, then we're living out of what? We're being a family, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We're Jesus' mother. We're Jesus' brother. We're Jesus' sister. We're part of the family. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> I mean, even if for the moment you feel all alone in this world, if you turn your life over to Christ, you'll, you'll work past that emotional streak and, and accept the liberating fact that you are never alone, really, when you think about it, because of your relationship with the God Almighty. Romans 8 and 15 says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. In other words, I didn't give you, God says, I didn't give you a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. Instead, you receive what? God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. So as God's adopted sons and daughters, we have the privilege not just of knowing God in salvation, but in knowing him and experiencing him on a family or personal level. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm adopted. <laughs> I'm adopted. I'm a family. But it goes beyond that, you see. If I'm a child of God and you're a child of God, then we can strike up what? Meaningful relationships with each other. We have the ability and we should have the desire for God's children and really the mandate, right? to be involved in each other's lives, helping, encouraging, and celebrating life together. Isn't that what family's all about? When somebody needs some assistance, you help them. You're there for them. That's what a church is for. That's what this church is for. Not just to come and worship God, and not just to come on a Sunday, not just to show off some new clothes, not just to gossip about somebody, what they did last week, not just to do all that stuff, but it's a place to minister to others and to be ministered to. The pastor isn't the only person that ministers to We all minister to each other. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe in small groups so much, because it's easier not to become lonely when there's people around you and you can have some relationship with, not just millions of people. You walk in and you hear the service and you leave, don't know anybody, nobody speaks to you. It's like going to the movies, right? You see the movie, there's lots of people around you. Mm -hmm. The movie's over, everybody walks out. Mm -hmm. Another way to overcome loneliness is know that God will never, 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 never turn away from you. You might think he has, but he really hasn't. There's a story that's kind of a cute story. One summer evening during a, a real bad thunderstorm, a mother was talking, taking her small baby, well, not a baby, but a, a small boy into bed. And she was about to turn off the light when, when he asked, Mommy, will you sleep with me tonight? Because you know, kids hear that in thunder to get scared. Mm -hmm. the, mother said, the mother smiled and she said, I can't, dear. She said, I have to sleep with your daddy. <laughs> then a long silence was broken when the boy said, that big sissy. Oh. <laughs> you see, the kid thought he was afraid of the lightning and that she'd have to go in there. <laughs> but maybe sometimes we felt like big sissies when it comes to meeting new people, right? And coming into relationships with them. Many times it's because we're afraid, really, of what others, right, think of us. They say, well, gee, they might think I'm from a, a different social level than I am. Or they might be 
highly educated than I was, or, or they might have more money than me, or, you know, we come up with all kind of crazy reasons why we shouldn't talk to somebody. And it goes the other way around, too. You know, sometimes if we have some of these things and we see somebody in need and they might not have graduated high school, they're out on the street with no home, or we going to shun them? No. Now, there are some people out there that are scam artists, so you've got to be careful and use what the Lord gives you. Psalm 27 and 10 says, Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. So even in the moments when we feel most alone and when those you love have turned their backs on you, right? God is still there. God is still there. With open arms and a smile on his face waiting to embrace you with his love and care. Now I wish that as I was growing up, I knew all this stuff. Because you know when you, you're going through life, you have relationships and and you go with somebody and then they leave you or whatever and you get hurt. Yes. And sometimes you feel like, this is it, there ain't no sense going on, I'm just too hurt. And you go into depression and all kinds of stuff. When all the time, God is still there and that's really all you need. Amen. Jesus speaks of those who are already in relationship with him like sheep. John 10 and 27. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Now, no one can snatch them away from me for my Father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anybody else and no one can snatch them from the Father's hand. Now, we can choose to reject God, right? But God doesn't reject us. No. Instead, what does he do? He watches over us like a shepherd watches over his sheep and wants to keep us safe and secure. And what about shepherds? When one little sheep in that flock leaves, he's after him trying to get that sheep. Even though he's got a hundred more that he can take to market or whatever they do, he worried about that sheep. And that's what God is worried about, that one sheep that, that strays from the flock. There's another way to overcome loneliness and might be hard for people to do. Seek to forgive uh -oh, those who have hurt you. I know families that have been mad at each other for, from birth to grave. They never forgive somebody for doing something. But God forgives them, doesn't he? Yes. They go to church every Sunday. Well, Aunt whoever or whatever, cousin this or cousin that, he did this back in 30 years ago. And I can't get over that. That's craziness. They take that stuff to the grave. But God forgives us and he wants us to be, if we're going to be more like him, then we got to forgive like him, right? And I think he forgives us for a lot more than we don't forgive somebody for. Now, for some of us, it's almost impossible to do. You might have been sexually, emotionally, or spiritually abused, and rather than seeking to forgive, you feel like you got a right to vengeance, right? Right? And I can understand that. But I know that ultimately, guess what? You're the one that gets hurt because it affects your life. When all those negative emotions that came from whatever happened in your life begin to start ruling your life, they keep you from building meaningful relationships, which keeps you from being lonely, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you see, when you don't want to forgive, it creates what we call negative defense mechanisms that make you feel that every person you meet has the worst intentions. I, I know where they come from. You know? It keeps you from being able to view others actually as being kind, generous, or having the best interest at heart. You know, somebody, you've gone through something, they say, gee, what happened last week or something, you know? And you're thinking to yourself, they want to know for it. I want to ask them one question. They might be just trying to help you to get through whatever it was that made you look upset, right? But what happens when you do forgive those people who have 
made you messed up, even though it might hurt from the pain that was inflicted upon you, right? You'll discover that those mechanisms of defensiveness will be gone. And then what happens? Then you'll learn to be loved all over again. And here's how many times we should forgive somebody. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Peter came to the Lord and said, Lord, how often should I forgive somebody who sins against me? Well, seven times should I? No, not seven times, Jesus said, but 70 times seven. I think he's trying to make a point here, right? Forgive. Forgive. And if they did it again, forgive them again. In other words, forgive them every time they do something wrong. And if we didn't get forgiven every time we did something wrong, we'd be in bad shape. <laughs> P Peter was trying to find out what's the bare minimum I can get away with here. Two times, three times, seven times? And Jesus said, no, you got to take it further. You need to always forgive. Not easy, not easy. But Jesus knew and knew what he was talking about because what happened to him? He would face the worst abuse, right, that was ever heaped upon a person, beaten, mocked, nailed to the cross. And then what happened? Luke, Luke 23, 34. Jesus said, after all this happened to him, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And the soldier gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. After he was tortured and nailed to the cross, forgive them because they don't know what they do. And at some point, no matter how difficult it might be, you need to look upon your abusers and say, listen, Father, I forgive them for every wrong they ever committed against me. And then and only then you'll be able to experience some relationships and see what a difference it makes in your life. What's the last way to overcome loneliness? Number four, allow God to heal your brokenness. Your heart can be broken for any number of reasons, right? And it hurts. But to break out of your loneliness, you need some healing. You need God to come in and heal you. Psalm 34, verse 17. The Lord hears His people when they call to Him for help. He rescues them from what? From all their troubles. Not just some. All. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and He record, re rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Amen. So there's nothing wrong with being broken and there's nothing wrong with experiencing grief, but there's time when you've got to let it go. What do they say? Let go and let God, right? Mm -hmm. Get rid of all the mess, right? And let God begin to heal our wounds. Psalm 73, verse 25, it says, Whom have I in heaven but you, Lord? Right? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health might fail, my spirit might grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart because He is mine for it. In the end, when it's all said and done, we have God to mend all that's broken inside of us. And just like his heart was broken at the death of his son. Gee, God knows where we're coming from. No. He knows what we're going through. He knows that we need healing and strength. You know, I, I felt alone in my life many times. But most of the time, guess what? It was my fault. Mm -hmm. And sometimes others might have contributed to the problem, but that was probably because I allowed outside circumstances to distract me from what God has promised us and what He wants for each and every one of us. So how do we overcome loneliness? We get connected to God through Jesus Christ. We get connected with people who know God, part of God's family, right? We get connected in every possible way we can. We get into a small group. We get into a Bible study class. We get into ministry. And how do we get rid of loneliness once and for all? We got to get that relationship correct with God and with others who know Him. Jesus died on that cross to give us a relationship with God. But not only that, He took it further and He commands us really to have a relationship with other Christians. 
through the cross and the resurrection, he formed the church of Jesus Christ, right? And through the church of Jesus Christ, he intended to end loneliness forever. Because he made us all a family. We're not out there as long rangers anymore. And that's why it's not good for people to say, well, I, I, I sit home and watch um, whoever on church, a church service on Sunday at home on TV. It's not the same. God made the church for people to come and fellowship with each other, not just to hear the word. That's part of it. But to fellowship with each other, to be a family. It's time to put an end to the loneliness. Amen? Make a decision that can change your life.